2 Corinthians chapter number 12. There was a preacher from yesteryear by the name of A.W. Tozer. Some of you may have heard his name before. But he, he made a statement about grace. He said this, Grace is the good pleasure of God that inclines him to bestow benefits upon the undeserving. Its use to us sinful men is to save us and make us to sit together in heavenly places to demonstrate to the ages the exceeding riches of God's, good, or God's kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Kind of a rich statement, but of course it talks about the, the grace of God and how important and vital it is to us and how, how much God gives that to us on a regular basis. And today as we continue our Grounded and Growing series, we're going to examine uh, the element of God's goodness that He provides to us uh, as often as we need is through His abundant grace. Grace itself, I know, can be difficult to define at times, but it becomes certainly real through various times in life when you need God's power to be evident, when you need God's presence to be evident, when you need peace, when everything outside you, uh, outside of your existence, everything around you is up in smoke or, or everything's at least burning. And the more we realize its value, this thing of God's grace, the more significant fruit will bear in the Christian life. Here in 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, we'll pick it up in verse 1. It says, It is not expedient for me, doubtless to glory. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell. God knoweth. Such, such a one caught up to the third heaven. And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory, but in my infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, for I will say the truth. But now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations there is given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, and in reproaches, and necessities, and persecutions, and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. The key verse is verse 9 here, which says, My grace is sufficient for thee. It's the key phrase within this whole passage we just read here today. And, and you have to ask sometimes, how is that so? Well, tonight, or today we'll look at it as we talk about being grounded in God's grace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the grace that you give to us on a daily basis, weekly basis, and even special grace that we need at times. Father, I do pray that it would become more real to us in our day-to-day -day living. And help us, Lord God, to have more of a clear channel to receive that grace so that we can use it in a greater fashion for the We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think I'm getting a little bit of an echo here. And uh, now I don't have any. <laughs> Why don't we just go to the pulpit, Mike? Go to number five. There you go. I'll, I won't run around too bad here today. <laughs> you know, as we look at this passage, we see that the Apostle Paul is communicating to, or communicating to us that he had a very special privilege. He had a special privilege to be able to see heaven. I mean, how many of us would love to have an opportunity and be able to come back and talk about what we saw when if God brought us up to heaven and just be able to communicate this. I know there's people that have claimed to have seen that and so forth. And, and I'll be honest with you, I, I think some of it may be a little bit questionable. But but Paul, because Paul, uh, when he was talking about this situation, he, he said it was quite overwhelming, actually. In fact, it's something that he could not even begin to describe. And he was certainly a learned man. He was a man that, that understood much scripture, much spiritual, under, he had much spiritual understanding, but he couldn't even begin to describe what it was like. Here in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2, it says, I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago. Whether in the body, I cannot tell, or whether out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. Such a one caught up to the third heaven. That's talking about the throne of God, where God abides. I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knows. How that he was caught up in the paradise and heard notice unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to other. In other words, he could not even begin to understand or comprehend or communicate to what he saw. 
And of course, not everyone gets that opportunity to get a glimpse of heaven and come back to tell about it. In fact, these details, again, could not even be explained in human terms. And I think there's a reason why that is. You know, the Bible mentions in 1 Corinthians 2 9, for it is written, I have not seen nor you heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God, which God hath prepared for them that love him. You know, I, I believe part of the reason, if you, you study out Scripture, we did a series on heaven here uh, some time back, and, and, uh, but there isn't a lot of detail given about that. There's a lot that, that goes on there. The Bible says here, we haven't begun to even see it or hear what takes place up there in heaven. And, and I, I think it's just simply due to the fact that we wouldn't even begin to understand it if, if God began to communicate it to us. You know, he, gave, he gives us a little glimpse there in the book of Revelation. He talks about the streets of gold and the pearly gates, and some of us are familiar with that. And, and some of those details that we can maybe comprehend a little bit, but God does not go into a lot of detail about what heaven's like. All we know is it's going to be heaven, right? It's going to be great. It's going to be way better than this world ever could ever hope to be. You know, Revelation 21.4 talks about something that will be in heaven too, and that's the suffering and pain that this world experiences. Revelation 21, verse 4, it says, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. You know, we can't begin to comprehend it because it's not what's reality in our world. Could you imagine a place where there's no crying? Could you imagine a place here today where you don't have any pain, where you don't ache and, and uh, have those pains that like, uh, one of our former college students come to me today, and we were out door knocking yesterday, and, and he said, oh, ah, my legs are tired today, and so forth. And Because uh, and, uh, you imagine waking up and not having your legs tired from walking all day, or, or, or from sitting all day, whatever you do, I guess. But could you imagine not growing old? Could you imagine not being hungry? Could you imagine a place that, uh, that you don't see people dying? Could you imagine a place with no violence? Could you imagine a place where you don't have to have to wonder uh, what's going to happen next in the sense of a negative things that move down your road? That's it's heaven's life. But we can't even begin to comprehend to what level that it's like because we we uh, it's not near the reality that we see on a day-to-day -day basis. Now some have tried to paint heaven uh, to be to be similar than here. You know, I've never. There was somebody I, I saw. Um, it's like a post on Facebook, and they had a they had a, a evidently somebody passed away, and that's a horrible thing. Don't misunderstand what I'm going to say, but but the statement was, well, this person is now in heaven having a beer with Jesus. And it's like, do you really do you really understand what you just said? But that's the way some people have painted the picture. And unfortunately, there's preachers that have painted that picture in the minds of people. That's really a gross distortion of what heaven is. Or maybe you've seen on the cartoons where, where you know, I remember, uh, I think it was like Sylvester and Tweety years ago, if you remember those old cartoons, you know, Sylvester was always going to the hot place, and <laughs> Tweety uh, was always going to another place, uh, however that word, poor, poor cat, you know. But, uh, but I remember that some of the pictures of heaven were just people are strumming on a cloud, you know. And, and it looked, I'll be honest, it looked a little dry. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's fun. We're just gonna sit and show on the clock. You know, or maybe some of those movies that they produce where they make heaven like it is here, and it's nothing like it at all. Again, I have not seen nor ear heard either entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared that all. And Paul, when he saw it, was like, "Can you explain?" Well, uh, uh, no. He couldn't even begin to explain it. He couldn't even begin to communicate it to him. I mean, it was such a unique experience. I'm thankful today that I'm going there. That's just not a proud statement. It's not a proud statement if you've been saved. I glory in the cross of Christ. That he saved my soul that was on the road to hell. The, the hell that I deserved. And he put me on a path towards eternal life. Can I ask you a question here today? You've been born again and you've been saved. Because heaven means very little to you then. Because without salvation, without being born again, as the Bible puts it, there will be no heaven. That's not God's desire for anybody. That's why Jesus Christ came 2,000 years ago to take us off the road to hell and put us on the road to heaven. But there's a choice that must be made. You must be willing to repent of that sin, the thing that offends God, and you must be willing to turn to Him with all your heart and place 
and you trust him alone, Jesus to be the one who saves you, that, that atones for your sin. I did that. It's coming up on 16 years ago. It's hard to believe it's been that long already. And that day forward, God has given me assurance from his word that I'm not going to heaven. You know how many people today are, are, are planning for their careers? You know, we, we have a minister of the University of Minnesota, and there's their students that are they're planning their careers. There's nothing wrong with that. There, there's, there's a right place for that. But then when, when you get into the workforce, what's the next thing you hear about? Oh, you've got to plan for retirement. And that's important, too. I mean, they're, they're certainly. But you know what? Most people aren't planning for eternity at all. I don't even think about it. They don't, they, don't even want to, they don't even want to comprehend it. Yesterday I was out knocking doors and I talked to a guy and I asked him, you know, if you die today, you're 100% sure you go to heaven. He told me, well, I, I really don't want to stress that right now. And he said, thank you, and just close the door. And, and it's like, don't bother me with the facts. Don't like, I don't want to think about it. And that's that's the condition of this world. I, I'll, it'll just work out somehow. Well, will your career just work out if it just, no. <laughs> Uh, your professors, those of you who are in college, would say you're silly, you're, you're ridiculous if you're not having some of a plan going forward. Well, is your retirement all just going to work out? You know, it's just going to work out in the end. Well, no, that's just not the way it's going to be. You have to plan. How can we think that's the way it's going to be with eternity? How can we think that, that eternity is just going to work out? No, God has a distinct plan in His Word. It's through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that you enter in to a relationship with God and they can get those sins for you. If you've never been saved, you've never been born again, there is no heaven for you, according to the scriptures, but that's not what God wants for you. God wants you to be saved. God wants you to be born again. God wants you to be forgiven. God wants to put you on the road to heaven because he loves you. If he didn't love you, he would have just left us all, all for that horrible consequence at the end of life, but he didn't. I'm thankful that uh, he provided that for me years ago. I don't want the other option. I want the right option. And Paul got to see, got a little bit of a glimpse of what was in store for him. He had a very unique opportunity to be able to do that. It was such a special privilege, though. It kind of put Paul in a unique category of people. A person that sees heaven. <laughs> Pretty unique category. Well, Paul was flesh and blood just like all of us. He calls himself the chiefest of sinners. Paul wasn't super human. Paul was human like you and I. And like you and I, sometimes that little flesh of ours, that little heart of ours, has to get proud. And, and trust me, people will get proud of us just about anything. They'll, proud of, they'll, be, they'll be proud about how strong they are. They'll be proud about how wimpy they are. They'll be proud about how smart they are. They'll be proud about how dumb they are. I mean, it's just people are like that. I've had people get proud of them and make comments to me about how proud they could, could shackle uh, sheetrock. It's like, if you can do it right, I'll hire you. I, I've done plenty of that in my life. I don't like to do it if I can avoid it. But I mean, people get proud about just about anything. And it was the same with Paul. Because God addresses this, he, he says so. Or I mean, Paul communicates something that was a concern to him, that certainly was a concern to God, why God put the thorn in his flesh. Verse 6, for though I would desire to glory, of course, I got to see heaven, guys. It must be pretty special. Well, Paul was a special guy. Oh, yeah, he was. But he's no special than anybody else here. He so I, I desire to glory, but I shall not be a fool. <laughs> what a strong statement. I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be. In other words, I don't want anybody thinking that I'm something special above anybody else, or that heareth me, and lest I should be exalted above measure. Through the abundance of the revelations, there was given me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. God evidently allowed Satan's messenger to buffet him. And that word buffet means to strike against or hit, to smack, if you will. 
to inflict pain in some regards into the life of Paul. It was a, a thorn in the flesh, as Paul calls it. Now, there's, there's different theories about what that thorn was. There are folks that believe that it was possibly poor eyesight, based on some other passages, some of the things that he says, kind of in passing. Whatever it was, though, it was something that kept Paul's heart humble. Kept him low. Kept him from getting proud. And struck down the temptation to be prideful of his experience. And God found it necessary to do that. See, that, that's going to mean I'm gone. No, it was for Paul's sake. It was for Paul's goodness. For Paul's good, I should say. Had Paul's experience lifted him up in pride, he'd be well on the road to a spiritual fall. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 16, verse 18, pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. God was going to give him a glimpse of heaven. God gave him a chance to see what heaven was like. Puts Paul again in that unique category, but Paul, flesh and blood like us, proud of God. God didn't want him to fall and tumble down the road towards destruction. So to prevent him from going that direction, God allowed the thorn to come. That doesn't make any sense to me. It makes perfect sense to God. It was an act of protection for Paul. Though I'm sure at times he didn't feel like it. Otherwise he wouldn't have asked three times for it to depart. <laughs> Now, this is the fun one I'm dealing with. Paul asks for relief, but God gives him relief in a way that, humanly speaking, again, doesn't seem possible. Or it doesn't seem like the root that God should have given to him. Because he tells him in verse 9, he said unto me, after three times of, of beseeching the Lord, I think it was more than just three prayers. I think he was, this is speaking of seasons of prayer, where he spent time asking God, can you please remove this? And, and, and probably giving God every reason why he should. And what's interesting is God doesn't, but he tells him something different. He says, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for thee. God told Paul that his grace would carry him through despite the thorn that was hurting him physically. That his grace would uphold him. His grace would strengthen him. That grace would would help him proceed down the road. And God tells us as well that through Paul's experience that God's grace is sufficient for us. I was reading this this past week and I saw that and I said, my grace is sufficient for me. In other words, in every area, every aspect of life that you can ever imagine, God has provided necessary grace for all of us should we desire to tap into doesn't matter what it is. doesn't matter what you're going through. doesn't matter well, what, what you're dealing with. God says, my grace is sufficient. Sufficient means all-encompassing. It means complete. It means sufficient. <laughs> and today, as we look more closely at verse 9, we'll see how God's grace helped Paul. And through his example, how it can help us as well. First off, God's grace is gives provisional strength. Provisional strength. Verse 9 again. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. When God allowed the thorn in the flesh, there was a purpose behind it. It was a purpose to put Paul in a position of weakness. A position where, you know, he, might, he was hindered. In some regards, a position where, where his uh, he probably got discouraged a bit, a position where he probably felt like if he could just throw this monkey off his back, so to say, it would things could be better. But God says, "No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do something in God's estimation better. I'm going to provide you my empowering grace." to help me carry that load. You know, Paul would need strength that he could not provide for himself. 
and he had to become weak. We don't like to be in that position. I'm going to be the first to admit, I don't like being in that position where I feel weak. <laughs> do you? Where you feel helpless? Where you feel like you can't do it? And we will, we will do everything we can to try to maintain our strength. But God will allow things to break that, that strength that we supposedly think that we have. Because one of the worst positions we can be in is in this position of self-sufficiency. In other words, I can do it. I can get it done. And sadly, we've been kind of have that mentality planted in our hearts today because of secular humanism. Secular humanism is the biggest cancer on our society today. I'll say that again. Secular humanism is the biggest cancer on our society because it becomes man becomes dependent upon himself and not God. Man tries to lift himself up by his bootstraps and thinks he can do it. He's supreme. He's number one and everything like that. And it doesn't take much for mankind, though, to realize that he is not all sufficient and that he is not all powerful and that he's quite weak. Because, you know, you can just take a, a bird flying into a, a jetliner, in, into, the, into the engine of the jetliner and bring it down. A, a little bird could do that. Grains of sand could prevent our cars from driving. I mean, God, could, God will use the littlest things to confound the mind. He's done that many times in the past. We are no match for his storms. We are no match for his earthquakes. We are no match for any. Oh, I've got the money to do it. You know, God can bankrupt our money in a minute. It's one of the worst cancers is when we begin to think we're self-sufficient. And when we think we are sufficient in ourselves, we're actually quite weak. There was a church back in, in the Revelation, one of the seven churches of Asia. And we see within that church a big problem. They were self-sufficient. And notice what God says about them. It says, that, this is the church of Laodicea, it says, because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. And notice not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. That was God's estimation. <clears throat> see, when we're self-sufficient, we have no need of God. And that's when pride rears its head and we steal glory that belongs only to God. You know, that's really what's happening in our country today. We don't need God anymore. We don't, you know what, we've got the bucks. We've kind of figured things out. God, you can take a back seat. In fact, I don't even like your moral, your moral lines. I, I, I don't like those, those things that you say are, are not right. Because those are the things I want to do. That's what our society is screaming to. We will not have this man rule over us. And that is their choice. But it comes with consequences. Because God is all sufficient. And again, that's the secular humanism. That man can lift himself up. That man has figured it out. That man can just manipulate, and buy out, and so forth. Well, eventually you run out of money. Eventually you run out of power. And eventually you can't control everything. There is a reason why on insurance claims it does say act of God. You ever read some of those insurance claims? Things outside of man's control. <laughs> we don't have the ability and the strength to do the things that we need to have happen. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1 29 that no flesh and glory in his presence. That's the reason why. Because none of us here today have the ability to sustain our own selves. Ultimately. Well, there's things that we do. We, we do work a job. We may exercise, eat as best we could. But ultimately, our hands are in his hand. Our lives are in his hand, I should say. And God's not going to allow any flesh to glory in his presence. And when God allows us to become weak, what happens is we're in a humble position to receive his grace that will provide strength because we've been in a position that we're completely dependent on. Initially, that could be a little scary. 
especially if you used to be self-sufficient. But Paul had learned that that's the best place he could be. He says, verse 9 again, most gladly therefore, why rather glory my infirmities and the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now there was a man that became weak in the Bible. He became extremely weak. His name was Moses. Remember, he was raised under the under the threshold of, of, the, of, of Pharaoh. And he became mighty in words and deeds, as the Bible records for us in Acts 7, verses 22 and 23. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty, notice the words and the deeds. In fact, Josephus, the Jewish historian, speaks of Moses being a mighty general. He was quite, he was quite, quite a significant man, quite an influential man. And when he was full 40 years old, he came into his heart to visit his brethren and children of Israel. Of course, that was with the situation where he killed the Egyptian, thinking that the Jews would follow him and so forth in the battle and then throw off the Egyptian bondage. It didn't happen, did it? He ran out into the wilderness for 40 years, just herding sheep on the backside of the desert. By the time God came to him at the year age 80, all that self sufficiency in Pharaoh, or in Moses, gone. God stripped him of it through that 40 years. By the time it came around, uh, Moses talked about how he stuttered. <laughs> Moses talked about how he couldn't, he couldn't talk very well. And, uh, and he's like, how, how can I go before Pharaoh? In fact, he tried to get out of the job two or three times. God wouldn't let him. He said, Aaron, with him. I'll, I'll let Aaron go with you. Of course, Aaron doesn't do a whole lot of speaking if you follow the story. But he had self-sufficiency stripped of him. But he became one of the greatest men of the Bible, most revered. Because he has got power and grace to flow through him once that self-sufficiency was stripped of him. You know, Paul experienced the same grace too. We still talk about the Apostle Paul today, of course his ministry and what he did. And certainly, Paul could have reasoned why how it would have been easier for him to minister without the thorn, but it, but his ministry would have been done more in the power of the flesh than the power of the Spirit. And God's grace supplied him with that power. And God's grace will supply us at our weakest moments so that we understand his great strength that he wants to work through us. The times when God manifests his strength will occur when we are at our weakest. Verse 10, therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I'm weak, then am I strong. God's power will flow through at those weak times. That His grace is sufficient for us. Secondly, there's provisional serenity. Verse 9 again, Paul says, and He said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in, the, in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. It says, most gladly glory in the infirmities. Again, this is a strange statement from a human perspective. Very strange statement. Because we would say, I glory in having it nice. I glory when everything's paid off. I glory when I'm healthy. I glory when I wake up in the morning and I feel like I just run uh, 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 forever. I don't need Red Bull or coffee or anything like that to get me going. I'm just... I'm just like that. I, I, I glory in, in, in feeling strong. I glory when, when everything's going well. I can glory in that. That's what we glory in. But Paul says, I gladly glory in my infirmities. In my infirmities. you have an infirmity today of some sort? Are you glorying it? Are you agonizing over it? I think sometimes if we're honest, we, we agonize over it. See, we try to rid ourselves of pain and problems, don't we? But Paul here is rejoicing. See, he's kind of a kooky fellow. <laughs> I'm not rejoicing in the, in the thing that I'm dealing with. How can Paul say that? Well, Paul went through some serious things, too, if you, if you read back in this book. The, the trials and, the, and the, the different things he went through. I, I haven't been through anything remotely close to what Paul's been through. <clears throat> Paul's rejoicing because he recognized and experienced God's grace strengthening his inner being. 
Ephesians 3.16 says that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory. The riches of his glory, you can just scroll away to his grace. To be strengthened with light by his spirit in the inner man. The inner man talking about the inside, the heart. Do you know anything about that today? That God gives you strength within your heart? That no matter what's going on on the outside, you can be at peace, have some serenity? That thorn meant by Satan to discourage and irritate and deflate the Apostle Paul, God used to bring Paul closer to himself. And Paul, as a result, experienced peace and joy that transcended his outward in pain and, and discomfort. Very unique. Some Christians have no idea what this is. Some know exactly what we're talking about. This thing of God's amazing grace. You know, Paul writes about it as he writes from, the, from a prison cell to the Philippian church. He says in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, Be careful for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, but thanks to the let your requests be made known unto God. Verse 7, In the peace of God, notice, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. In other words, there is a peace that's found in the group through the grace of God that can uphold you in the worst circumstances of life. It's hard to believe, isn't it? But if you've experienced it in any level, you can know that reality. It was that experience of God's grace seeping into Paul's heart that not only strengthened him to keep going faithfully, but joy and peace in the midst of that form that form poking him and prodding him, discouraging him, and trying not to at least. It's a very special piece of joy that's only experienced when one's heart has been brought so low and so dependent on God. It certainly passes our understanding. It's like, why, why am I okay with this? Why, how can I just keep going? How can I just have some restful joy within my heart? Despite you know, tomorrow I can fall off the abyss. <laughs> it's so many words. You know, you ever have a time in your life where it's just like multiple little things are coming at you? And it's like, I've been in those times where you feel surrounded a little bit by problems, potential circumstances, and so forth. But God's peace and God's strength that seems to be hard through His grace, it just kind of keeps you going. It kind of just keeps you going. Keeps you from getting stressed up. Keeps you from just uh, collapsing spiritually. It, it, it's a very special grace. By the way, it's only going to be found if you spend time with them. We'll talk about that during the 9.30 hour. But, uh, you know, it does say, be careful for nothing but prayer and supplication. You know, we're in a good position when we get weak because we see, we experience something that God can provide for. I think that's one of the reasons why Paul came to gladly accept the infirmities because it placed him in a position of God, gaining God's grace that provided the sufficient joy and peace. And the Bible says in Isaiah 26 verse 3, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusted them. You know, it gives you an opportunity to find out what God can supply for you. It's a peace that the world cannot give. You know, John 14, 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world give, it, give I unto you, but not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You know, sometimes we, we really look for peace in this world. We, we look for an assurance from somebody to say something, you know, to promise us things. Have you ever had somebody promise you something and then not come through? I have people promise, I'll be in church as pastors yet. Where'd they go? I don't know where they did a job. <laughs> I have lots of promises. Well, I'll, I'll come through here. Uh, I'll come through here. And it's like, uh, not even close. They have promises broken. The world can't give you peace. The world can't even come through on its promises. Sometimes it's even with the best of intentions. It's with the best of intentions. And, and they mean it. But sometimes things happen outside of people's control, too. And they can't fulfill it. You know, I could promise you 
absolutely anything. Pastor, you'd never lie. Well, maybe you know, don't intend to, but maybe sometimes just things happen. You know, we, we, can't, we can't base our peace and our hope on the promises of men. That, will, that may provide us some quote, peace, but it's not going to be lasting peace. The world cannot give it. And God's peace cannot be explained other than the manifestation of God's grace in one's life. You can't explain it. It's a powerful testimony to those who do not know God, by the way, too. Now, I wonder if Saul of Tarsus, Paul, of course, before he was converted, felt the effects of a life that could stay at peace while he was being stoned to death. I'm talking about Stephen. man who was full of faith in the Holy Ghost. And as they were stoning him, what did he say in Acts verse 7, verse, or chapter 7, verse 59 and 60? And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this into their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. I wonder how that shook the, the heart of Saul of Tarsus, the man who was mad against the church, the New Testament church there in Jerusalem, did everything he possibly could do contrary to the name of Christ. In fact, he mentions in Acts 22, verse 20, he says, And when the blood of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. Notice, he heard this. He was standing right by. Because Stephen, let out, let him know, I forgive you. I, I'm not mad at you. How could anybody do that? The grace of God. The grace of God. It so shook the rabidness of the Saul of Tarsus that eventually broke. Eventually just broke. Why? Because that man had something. That man has something he did not have. For a while, it just ripped at the core of the salt Tarsus where he was taking it out on Christians. Until finally God came down and said, it's hard for you to kick against the Christ, isn't it? They're all for salt. It was. You know, when we have that peace in the midst of life storms, and we can, we can, we can display it, not for our Lord's sake, but His, sure does send a resounding message that we have something that's real, doesn't it? She certainly sounds like it. Because the, the world expects the average person to act in fits of rage and anger and, and even emotionally collapse. But a Christian who is plugged into God's grace can survive and fact go higher despite the personal forms. It tells people that what we have in Christ is real. Is it real in our lives today? Is it, is it something that's very real? You know, our world today is full of chaos. You know, you, you turn on the television set, turn on the radio, go on the internet. You swear the world won't collapse at any moment. <laughs> oh, we got a new peace deal, possibly. You know, how long does that last? Well, as long as the other one, the other thousands have been signed and broken. But God has told us how this thing's going to end. What's going to happen in the end? God has told us that we can trust Him, that He's in sovereign control of everything, even when things are seeming like they're up in smoke. And even in the midst of storms and thorns of life, God can grant us grace that puts our hearts in serenity and peace, a peace that the world does not understand. Now let the world freak out about everything. Remember, when people, remember that old Ebola thing happened? You know how many people I heard were just, oh, we're going to go, we're going to go, what's going to happen? You know, I think there's one case out of 329, 330 million people live in this country. See, we, 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 we're like, wait a minute. You know, there, let's get some perspectives here. You know, you, you look at social media, and of course, people start, you know, they talk about vaccinations, start slamming, you know, all this stuff that goes on, because people get cheered up in fear. Let the world freak out. Let God's people be like, I know all it's going to end. <laughs> By the way, that's why God gives us prophecy to tell us, I know the end of the story. We know the end of the story. We don't have to be in a fit of rage. Because our lives in this world is controlled by the sovereign hand of God. And Colossians 1.17 says, And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Isaiah 
Hosea 41.10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yeah, I will help thee. I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. We've got a God who's in control. And it's God's grace that upholds us when everything, when nothing in this world will. It's to be the anchor of our soul. Hebrews 6, verses 18 and 19. That by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, he might have a strong consolation. Who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have for us as an anchor of the soul. Oh, sure, it's that best. Those who do not know Christ the Savior have absolutely no access to this special grace. But those who have been saved, you've got, you've got more than enough access to it. It's just a matter of striving to access it. But there's provisional serenity. Well, thirdly and finally, and we're going to have to move quickly, there's provisional supremacy. Verses 9 and 10 again, and he said unto me, My strength is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I brought, rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. I would say that based on Paul's wording that he found supremacy in God's grace. In other words, personal victory over that form without God removing. God's grace provided or proved to be sufficient to strengthen his heart and provide peace to his soul without the outward circumstances changing to enable him to be the testimony that God wanted him to be. We call this being victorious. And the devil can't conquer a person like that. The world cannot conquer a person like that at all. But certainly Paul wasn't conquered. God's grace is sufficient for us to be victorious as well. He says again in verse 9, my grace is sufficient. Is sufficient. That's all you need. And God will put us through things to prove that to us. And when we learn a lesson like Paul did, oh, what a mighty, mighty weapon the hand of God we can for the glory of our Again, it tells us that nothing can trump God's grace. Maybe today you're struggling with the form. There might be a thorn in your flesh of some sort, something that you consider a thorn, something that weighs you down, something that discourages you, something that seems to be, if it would just be removed, I could go better and higher, but God wants to help you get victory over that, whatever it is, without having to remove it. He may remove it, he may not. Regardless of what it is, he wants you to have victory over it. You know, maybe it's a sin issue. Maybe there's a besetting sin that trips you up constantly. Well, the Bible says in Romans 5, 20, more the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Ah, great verse. God's grace can help you overcome a sin issue. God's grace can, is sufficient to provide us personal victory in every area of life. There are no exceptions. Romans 8, 37, Nay, in all these things we are more than what? Conquerors through him that loved us. That's a great word. I like that word, conquerors. It means, it means beating back and, and becoming victorious. It doesn't matter what it is. There are no exceptions. Second Corinthians, uh, well, our first Corinthians 1, 15, 57, but thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't care today if you're dealing with depression. I don't care if you're dealing with loneliness. I don't care if you're dealing with anger or pride or fear or stress or some besetting sin. God's grace is more sufficient for you than you would begin to imagine. All you need to do is get more plugged into it. And maybe today you need to get plugged in by being saved. Maybe you need to, that's the problem. Maybe. You've maybe just never been saved. But God wants to show His grace by saving you, bringing it to Himself. And then when He brings you to Himself, that you walk with Him daily. And then instead of running to the world for answers, you run to Him for His grace and the direction and leadership in life. Because God's grace can give you the victory. You know, James 4, 6 says, But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the problem, and let us do grace and the humble. That thorn is there to help us stay humble. Because every one of us has a problem with pride. He'll use that thorn to humble ourselves. And if we humble ourselves under that thorn, seek his face, you'll find him. I don't think God wants us to live, anybody here to live a defeated life. God has a purpose and a plan for everybody here to glorify Him in some regards. But sometimes it's those that are, are living in defeat all the time. 
and not experiencing the grace of God that is available to them, that hinders them from finishing their course faithfully and, and uh, not experiencing the joy that there is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the more grounded we get to this understanding, the more mature we'll find about spiritually, the more like Christ will be. God help us to be grounded in His grace.